Howdy, folks, and welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom. The color cast is on the air now from CBS Television and Radio. It is Friday night, November the 7th, 1997, and Robert Blake is here tonight. Uh, he is our entire program. Uh, Robert joins us so every now and again on a Friday night for some psychotherapy, and <laughs> it is always a joy to have him here. You know, I've been sneezing and wheezing all day, and I thought there might have been some pollen in the air. I'm allergic to airborne pollen, but I've got a cold coming on, a bad weekend cold. And I've just had about 8,000 units of vitamin C. And uh, so if, if, if I sneeze on the air, please get off me. I, you know how you don't want to be caught doing something on the air like, you know, this or something like that? You just don't want to get caught sneezing on the air because your face really looks stupid. Anyway, what I thought we'd do tonight for just a few seconds here is go through a list of books uh, that would qualify for being the shortest book of the year. For example, Things I Wouldn't Do for Money by Dennis Rodman, you see. Uh, or a book entitled Human Rights Advances in China. Uh, the Book of Virtue by President Bill Clinton. Or To All the Men I've Loved Before by Ellen DeGeneres. I thought you'd like <laughs> My Plan to Find the Real Killers by O.J. Simpson. Uh, Intelligent Sayings from Strom Thurmond. Or another political book, Al Gore, The Wild Years. <laughs> uh, Amelia Earhart's Guide to the Pacific Ocean. America's Most Popular Lawyers. Or Detroit, A Travel Guide. How about Different Ways to Spell Bob? Or George Foreman's Big Book of Baby Names? Or 101 Spotted Owl Recipes by the Environmental Protection Agency? Or a career book, <clears throat> Staple Your Way to Success. <laughs> and finally, How to Sustain a Career in Music by Art Garfunkel. Thank you very much. <laughs> little list of short books. By the way, did any of you guys or any of you there watch Marv Elper tonight with Barbara Walters? Oh, man. You know, Marv, if you, I've known Marv for a long time, and I won't pr presume that Marv watches this program, but I've known Marv since I worked at Channel 4 in New York, uh, to, you know, 20 years ago and more. You know, Marv, you should have come on here because we don't edit what you say. The problem when you go on with Barbara Walters, who's an honest journalist and does her job very, very well, but the problem when you go on these magazine shows is they shoot maybe 25 or 30 minutes of tape, and then they drop in little segments, like tonight Marv would say something, and now they show Marv walking out of the courthouse, and they show the woman, and they show the picture with the bites and everything, and his, his fiance was sitting next to him, and it, it, was, it was tough. Very, very, very tough. Marv, you should have come on here. Another short book, huh? Robert Blake is here tonight for uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Friday Night Fights, or whatever he has in mind, and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as they fly through the air. Marv, you should have come on here. Robert Blake began his acting career. Hold on now. He began his acting career, just in case they don't know who you are. He began his acting career in the 1930s as a child star, and since then he has given us memorable performances in television programs that include Beretta and great motion pictures like In Cold Blood. It is always a joy to welcome Mr. Blake to CBS, and thanks for coming on. Now, I want to apologize to you for something. The first time you came on here, what is it, about two years ago now since, you, since we've been doing this. Seems like I've known you since I had a bicycle. Yeah, I understand that. Same here, pal. But we promised you some folks in folding chairs. Yes. You know, blue-haired ladies, I think, was your time. I don't even care if they're dead. Get them from the morgue. <laughs> anything. Anything besides you. <laughs> and for whatever the reason, we haven't been able to accomplish. The crew even volunteered to go out and rent blue-haired wigs and wear them. But I, there's only so much I can tolerate. Get a bus and go to Pasadena. Tell them you're going to have George Hamilton on. They'll come out in droves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but I wouldn't be able to stand the tech 10 seconds of whining when you walked out, huh? Anyway, we've talked about all the stuff that you've done. I know, I'm not smoking. Okay. I'm a much better person when I smoke. I stopped smoking. I put on 20 pounds. I'm a fat pig, and I can't afford to be. Because when I look down, I can't see my stuff. I could be all right if I had, like, a really big, but I don't. I'll stop it. So it's no good. On. I got to get skinny again because I'm too insecure not to look down there and know I still got my, my Your equipment. Your stuff, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, speaking of stuff, speaking stuff. of equipment, with all the things that you've done, the Berettas and the movies that you've made, the shows, and, the, and, and when you were a kid as the actor, you must have an awful lot of, like, memorabilia and souvenirs and stuff, huh? Funny you should ask. Funny I should bring it up. Now, look at that man. He should have a number under him. Isn't that pathetic? No matter how good I feel, I still look up on death row. I always look the same way. 
That's a person that you visit on death row. The last time you were when here. When he's got three weeks left before he takes the big ride on the electric swing. What? You remember the last time you were here, you had the swept back, the pompadour hair, and you, you, you looked terrific yeah. the last time. Now you're back to the, to, the, to the gaunt look. Well, they tell me I look like Richard Gere, don't I? Not at the lighthouse, sir. <clears throat> what? See, what? <laughs> here's the thing. I am, a very nice thing is happening here. See, I have like 60 years of stuff. Right. Going back to the 30s. Yeah. And I'm getting to be an old geezer. And if a bus runs over me tomorrow, or some jealous husband knocks me off or something, <laughs> my kids are going to have two houses full of junk to say, what are we going to do yeah, with this stuff? Yeah. We can't give it away, you know, Dad croaked and all like that. And you know where it goes, Bobby? It goes out on the curb, and the sanitation picks it up, and they cart it away. Along yeah, with me. Along with In you. a garbage bag. Exactly right. And, you know, say, say, well, give it all to UCLA, and then you can get a, a, a tax deduction. Right, right off, right. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm, 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 I'm getting a website. Really? Now, you see, I don't know. I'm, I, you know, I'm dyslexic. I can't get my shoelaces tied. But my secretary is putting together a, 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 a website. Right. And I've been answering fan mail since the 30s. I figure everybody in America has got at least three pictures of me someplace in their closet or their toilet or something. Okay. I'm going to put everything... I got like hundreds of pictures of me and the little rascals, yeah. pictures of me and Red Ryder, pictures of me at, at Warner Brothers with Garfield and all those people. I'm putting it all on the website, and I'm going to let everybody in America... See, it's kind of cool. So when people you think could about come it, down, they gave it all to me. Yeah, but don't lose the thought here. www.robertblake.com. It's called Robert Blake's Junkyard. Okay, dot That's com. The name. Okay. And they but, come there and they can bid for it or just... No, no, I'm going to... I'm going to... First thing that's going to happen, see, you don't understand. They're going to download it. They're all going to get everything. If somebody is Bob, a little rascal fan... Believe me, I understand it. I don't understand Trust it. me. Now, you if have a little... If somebody's a little rascal fan, they can take all them pictures the stuff when I was working on the set. Mm -hmm. So they said, bring some of the stuff down tonight. So I just closed the, my hand. I reached in the bag, and I pulled out. That turns out to be the picture of the first Little Rascals that I did. That's the director, me sitting on his lap. And see on the top, yep. it has the date, 1938 or 1939. Man, this, you, is, this is little Robert Blake right there. And I got And who's, of, who's the director? What's this mean? His name is Eddie Kahn. And that's the guy who, I was an extra, and some little rummy couldn't say the lines, so I said the lines, he said, give that kid the give job. Give the kid the job, okay. And he was so this will be on the job. website, right? All that kind of junk is going to be there for them. And then after maybe a year or so, when everybody has gotten downloaded, downloaded all this it, stuff, right? taken all of it, right. then I'm going to find places to give it to. Oh, very good. You know, like, like, like maybe... Nutley, New Jersey, my hometown, wants a couple of pictures mm -hmm. of this or that. I'll just give it to them. Like I found the other day... Like is, your, found, is, is your birthplace still there in Nutley, New Jersey? Unless they blew it up or something, yeah. Nutley, I mean, New we Jersey. could have the, not only the Robert Blake Library, we could have the Robert Blake Birthplace. <laughs> you know, like they have the Richard Nixon Library and Birthplace. The, the Blake Robert Blake Graveyard. Library, Graveyard, and Birthplace. He, he was born here and he died here. Like I have a trunk, maybe with a hundred scripts in it. Okay. with all of my notes mm -hmm. of all the, the stuff that I did back in the 50s and the 40s. I'm going to give that back to America. And I, when, I, when, when I was a kid, I was very strange and troubled and As we've discussed here in the past. And yes. nuts. And what I used to do when I worked, I would steal something from the gig. I don't know why, but that's what I did. I would steal something. Like, 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 I stole Lana Turner's leather jacket mm -hmm. that she wore with Clark Gable in that movie. I was on the set. Oh, <clears throat> short, short story. Buckwheat and I... Did you want to wear the leather jacket is why you took it? No, I just would take just it. Just wanted to have it, okay. I just, I would, I would take stuff and, and take it home with me. Because I didn't have to ask. I couldn't get my picture taken with them. My folks were like geeks and wouldn't, you know, they were not... So I would just steal something and take it home with me. I was, Buckwheat and I were pals, right? Mm -hmm. We used to roam around the studio together because mm -hmm. he was like the, the, the outcast because he was the little black kid. And I was the out kid because I, I was the outcast because I was Mickey Gubatosi, see? And you weren't supposed to, you had to be a white kid in order to be a star. 
They changed my name to Bobby Blake so I could be a star in a movie. Right. Before that, I was Mickey Gubatosi. And when you're a WAP, you're, that's, you're, so Buckley and I hung out. We used to roam around. So that one day, we're roaming around, and we walk into a sound stage, and they used to have these little dressing rooms. They were like little boxes. Cubicles, yeah. Yeah, and they were right next to the camera. Yeah. And when a star walked off the set, they walked into one of these little boxes. There was nothing in there but a makeup thing and a couch. Gotcha. There wasn't a John or any of that kind of stuff. So the door was a little bit open, and we peeked in there. And what we saw was a beautiful, naked lady's behind and two legs. Mm -hmm. It was like a Varga girl. It was like, like, like mm -hmm. a calendar. And we're like looking at this thing, and into the, into the frame comes a hand with a needle and gave her a shot in the ass. And we're like, I never saw anything like that in my life. These beautiful legs and this to glorious To this day, year I've never end. seen anything like that I'm in my life where the needle you, comes in and gives her a shot. All of a sudden, the head pulls around, and it's Lana Turner. Really? And she turns around, and she straightens up, and we thought we were going to get shot. And she said, and that's the best you'll ever see, <laughs> and walked away. So I went in her dressing room, and I stole her jacket. When I work with Bogart, here's the thing. When I work with Bogart, see that picture? See that cup? We're, we're coming to it. OK. See that cup in front of him? All right, what picture is this? That's the treasure Sierra Madre when he threw the water in my face. Yeah, OK, OK. So I stole the cup. See, there's the cup. Now, that don't mean anything to you or me. No. But somebody in Peoria, Illinois, would like to have Whoops. that on their dresser. <laughs> or I, I don't think you could break it. Or, and then I stole his watch. <laughs> this is Bogey's watch? That's Bogey's watch. Wow. A couple of years ago, I ran into Lauren Bacall. And I showed her the watch. And I said, do you recognize this watch? She says, of course I do. That cheap bastard had a leather band on it. The watch ain't worth much, but I spent $2,000 for that band. And as you can see, the band is rose gold and fancy, and the watch is... No, you ain't going to do that. I'm just going to try it on, kid. No, I mean... I think it's me, don't you? Absolutely. Bob, thanks a million, kid. I won't, uh, have, to, I won't <laughs> have to come to the website. <laughs> you know, the one thing we've never talked about here, we've talked about, you know, your, the, the little rascals, we've talked about the movies you've made and, the, you know, your escapades with movie stars. You were in the military in the Korean War at that time frame. Oh, my Lord. What, what was your job in the, uh, in, 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 in the war? <laughs> my job was stealing. <laughs> <laughs> I started... How do I know that's Bogey's watch? I really don't know that's Bogey's watch. You don't know that that's the cup either. All you know is that I told you that that's it was. Exactly right. There is a problem there because anybody can say I'm a liar. What do I care? What do I care? I know it's his watch. Um, anyway, the Korean War. <sighs> Well, I know we're going awfully fast, Bob. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, I got drafted, and I didn't show up, and they came, and they collected me, and said, you want to go to jail or you want to go in the Army? And I was drunk and crazy. I'm probably the only person that was disappointed that he didn't get sent to Korea. Really? Because I was so nuts, I would just as soon go over there and kill and get killed and all that stuff. I got sent to Alaska uh, to test the equipment for the infantry. I was in the infantry, but we went to Alaska and cold weather well, you stuff. you tested cold weather gear cold because weather, they yeah, fought in the snows in Korea. Fingers sure. frozen and their toes and ears and stuff like that frozen. And I, 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 first I wound up in the nut house. And then I got out of the nut house and went back in the infantry again. And then they transferred me to special services and I started directing plays and movies and all that kind of stuff. And then I went to the stockade because I fell in love with a girl. And uh, they arrested me for statutory rape. How old was the girl? Well, she was in high school. I was like 19 and she was in high school. I didn't care. I wanted to marry her. Mm -hmm. And the father came after me with a 357 Magnum and went to the post commander. And I wound up in the stockade, I was going to go to Leavenworth for the rest of my life. And, and <laughs> then I was, under, I was under house arrest, and then I was under bunk arrest. You know what bunk arrest Probably is? Probably that you have to stay in your bunk. All day long. When you want to get up and go to the latrine, in there's the a guy with a 45, and he holds onto your belt. And you walk in the latrine, 
and he lets you go, and then he holds you again. When you want to go eat, he holds on to you. Anyway, a priest got me out of that, and uh, <laughs> they put me in handcuffs and took me to the airplane and sent me back and discharged me. <laughs> for, Thereby ending your, your, your auspicious military from, career, huh? But, well, yeah, well, I see, I, I did a lot of stealing while I was in the Army, too. I didn't know, you know, it's very weird. I, I was taught to steal when I was like two years old. Who taught you? My father. Yeah. It was back in the Depression, and it was, it was, it's not so much, see, I never knew that you weren't supposed to steal. No, if your father was doing it, you would think everybody did it. When I was like two or three years old, my father taught me and my sister, who was like a year older than me, we get up every morning, and she had a milk bottle full of water, and I had an empty milk bottle, and we would walk out in the tenement and follow the milkman, and whenever he put a bottle down, I'd run up, open the bottle, take a little bit of milk, pour it in my bottle, then I pour a little water, water back in, in their bottle, the yeah. and after four or five bottles, I had a quart of milk. And I thought that's what you did. Mm -hmm. My mother went to the market with a shopping bag. And while she was picking things up, my job was to take stuff and throw it in a shopping bag, because I was like two feet high, gotcha. and nobody's paying attention to me. I thought that's the way the that's world That's the way everybody, hey, if mom does it, if dad does it, everybody does it. When I went to MGM, I stole. When I was 18 years old, when I was eight years old, I went to public school, and I thought everybody stole. I thought everybody drank. The kids all thought I was really special because I could drink. I started drinking when I was three or four years old. I didn't know you weren't supposed to drink. When I was on the set, I drank. If somebody put down a beer, I would drink it. If somebody put down a cup of coffee, I'd drink it. If they laid down a cigarette, I picked it up and smoked it. So when I was eight years old, I went to public school, I was a big shot because I could steal. Smoke when it came lunchtime, I climbed the, the chain link fence, went to the market, stole ice cream and cupcakes, and that was my, that, I, isn't that insane? That How come I'm not dead? You're not dead because nobody caught you. Now let me pause here for a little break, okay? And then we'll okay. continue with Robert Blake and you on the toll free. We'll be right back uh, after this short break. What do you just... With, just with uh, Robert Blake, Robert Blake's facelift and how he didn't take any dope afterward, and just went right straight on the natch because he hasn't had any dope or alcohol in eight years. Well, good for you. I'm not sure it's the right thing to do. Well, then uh, it, I hope that I don't look back on it and say I should have gone out like Dick Boone and Lee Marvin. But and you the rest have to remember heroes. something in life: we don't play a game called "I should have." You can't play "I should have" or "If only I had." That those games are not relevant. Because all of my heroes croaked younger than I am. Mm -hmm. So if I went ahead the way I was going, then I would be dead. You might be. Then I wouldn't be here. You might be. Because I'd be under the ground. But they, they went out with class, man. I, I, no, I can't do that. I've got to keep going. You away. know, there was a guy on this show who he wrote a book about Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. And he wrote about Tracy's drinking. I guess Tracy, he, he didn't drink all the time. Like, he'd be sober for a while, this man said, and then he'd go on a five, six, seven, eight-day bender. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, longer than that. He'd be gone a couple of weeks. They'd find him in New Orleans. He had a hotel in Chicago where they always knew he was going to be. That's right. He'd go to Chicago. I love Spencer Tracy. He was so cool. When I would go in the commissary, you know, there'd be, here's Charles Lawton and a group over here, and there's a group over there. Now I'm like five or six years old, and I would go and sit near... Spencer Tracy, mm -hmm. so I could listen to him, yeah. and he'd be sitting there eating. One day, this is just a short story, he's eating, and he has a group of guys around him, and behind him is a guy with a pad asking him questions, doing a story on him. Mr. Tracy, yada, yada, and he's throwing his answers over his shoulder. So he says, uh, Mr. Tracy, what is an actor? And Tracy says, you're an actor when they pay you, and Gable's the best because he gets the most. <laughs> and the reason I like being at this studio is because me and Gable are straight, and most people here are queer, so we get all the girls. <laughs> the man said that. Gable and Tracy had dressing rooms next to each other, the, big, the, the permanent dressing rooms. Right. And they broke a hole and put a door between them, so if either one of their wives or Hep or somebody showed up, they could send the girl. This man said that. that in they, the they other could room. send the girl back. True story. I was there. I was there. And it's true. There were a lot of gay people at MGM. I don't know why. Maybe because who, who knows why. 
the musical world brought him out from, from New York or whatever, but he said that he and Gable were straight and that was the best studio to work at. Very good. Here's <laughs> Keith on the toll-free now in Shawnee, Kansas. Hi, Keith, you're on the air. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome, sir. Good evening, Mr. Blake. Yes. I'd like to ask you um, uh, about your experiences uh, working with Truma Capote in, uh, in Cold Blood. What your general impressions were of the man. I love Truman most dearly. I've lived a long life and I've had the privilege of being around several geniuses in my life, like Dr. King or whoever they might be, and Truman was definitely one of them. I didn't get to know him until after the movie. But I, was he present during the shooting no, of the movie? He was not he there. He came to Kansas one time because they were doing a cover of Life magazine. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to him and he didn't talk to me. He was terrified of me. Uh, we didn't have anything to do with each other. But afterward, we became the very best of friends. Truman would call me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Hello, Robert. Hi, this is Truman. Like I didn't know who the hell it was, yeah, right? right? <laughs> Truman, where you are? I don't know where I am, but there's an ocean and people have gowns on. I think I'm in the principality somewhere. And we talked for hours. He called me one time from Fire Island. And he was the only person on Fire Island because there was a hurricane and everybody had been removed. Oh, they left, sure, sure. But he was down in a basement because he was in charge of his friend's dog. There was a black lab female dog mm -hmm. and he was down in the basement and he says, Robert, you know about animals because I dig animals. He said, I'm here in charge. I think she's having babies. What do I do? Now, there's a hurricane, and he's in the basement all by himself. We did like two hours on the on telephone the phone, yeah, yeah. while I talked them through. Here comes another one, Robert. Shall I do the same thing? Do I have to cut that thing again? Yeah, cut the thing, Truman. I loved him. He was a, and a brilliant, brilliant man. The play that they wrote about him was good, and I saw it. But oh, I the one Robert Morse did on Broadway, huh? True. That was the Truman that they saw on talk shows and things like that. I don't think they talked about people that knew him because the thing I didn't see in the play was his genius. He had tremendous insight. He knew what was going on in the world. He was one of those Mort Saul, Jack Kennedy kind of people that had an overview of everything. You could, more, you could ask Truman about anything, and he knew about it. He traveled all over the world and sat with giants. He was a beautiful cat. Did you, during the filming of In Cold Blood, ever encounter this attorney who was with the McCarthy hearings, Joseph Welsh? Remember, he was in that picture. I wonder if you did any scenes with him. He was in In Cold Blood? Mm -hmm. As an actor? Mm -hmm. What did he play? He played an attorney. Really? Yeah. Not in the courtroom that I was in. Oh, well, maybe I'm mistaken. I thought he had. Anyway, Keith, great question. I'm glad you called, and thank you for watching, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, sir. Good we on. will continue with Robert Morse and talk with friends he's met along the way. And no, meet, no. Or, excuse me, Robert George Blake. Hamilton. Or Robert Blake. <laughs> <laughs> see, Robert Morse, Truman Capote. Yes, yes. Robert Blake. See, I'm fighting a sneeze here. It's making me nuts. Get off me before I, before I blow everybody sneeze. out of the room. We'll be right back. With Robert Blake on the toll-free, here's Gail calling tonight from Garnerville, New York. Hi, Gail, and welcome to CBS. Hi, Tom. Hello. It's great. It's the first time I'm speaking to you. Um, Thank you. Oh, and Robert, I adore you. My question is, were you around the um, studios around MGM in the 30s when the Wizard of Oz was, was going on? Yes. As a matter of fact, I was. You, you know, I it? never went back and got the rest of my face done. When I got my face fixed, <laughs> the guy the said... The woman is calling to ask you whether or not... I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to well, talk about do that. Do that and then do the face thing. See, one of my ears is hanging out wrong. I never went you back and got what you, What did you have trim. done to your face? I got a facelift. Don't ask me why. I do okay. a lot of dumb things in my life. Okay, fine. Instead of getting a haircut, I got, you know, my okay. face circumcised. Uh-huh, okay. But you were supposed to go back afterward and get the trim done. And I never went back to get the trim done. I was just noticing that... I didn't get it finished. No, it's all... See how one of my ears is sticking out? Yeah, I do. I see that. But not yeah. that... But not he so said, don't worry, I'll put it back where yeah, it belongs. I messed up a little It's not that bad, Bob. It's not that bad. Believe hey, me. Hey, listen. But what's happening is your face is starting to fall again. See, they lift it, but then at our age, it starts to fall again. But there's always... See, half of the people in the world are female. 
and every once in a while you run into one of them that don't care mm -hmm. whether your face is fallen or not. That's right. I was, uh, yes, when they were doing the Wizard of Oz, once again. No, no, but wait a minute. <laughs> what? Did you get your face fixed so, so that chicks would like you? I have no idea why I got my face fixed. You know, it's like the rabbit who jumped in a briar patch said it was a good idea at the yeah. time. Yeah. I don't know why I got my face fixed. Everybody was getting their face fixed. You got you know, your face fixed. When, when, when I came back into business, I was gone for a year or two, and all of a sudden I'm looking around at Warren Beatty and Redford and all these guys that are my age, and they all look like my son. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want to play their father. Yeah. I'm going to go get my face tweaked, which was dumb. Because now when I look at myself, I don't look the way I feel. I feel entirely different than that guy. Anyway. Anyway. At MGM. Buckwheat and I used to roam around the Ray studios. Ray Bolger, Judy Garland. Yes. Jack Haley. And the cool thing about going on the set was that there were 300 midgets there, and we were bigger than all the midgets. You've talked about this. We didn't know they were making a masterpiece. Right. And beside that, the midgets were all drunk, which was great. You told us and that, And they too. were stooping on the set and doing all these right. crazy things. But I did see the yellow brick road. I was there when they tore the, the, the wall down between the two, two sound stages so they could make it bigger mm -hmm. to go on the yellow brick road. I love Judy Garland. I love Judy Garland. She was absolutely magic. She was cool. I knew a lot of great people, man. I, I, knew, I knew, knew, knew Marilyn Monroe. You know, all this stuff about the paparazzi, just very, very briefly. Okay. This whole gag about the paparazzi. Marilyn used to just turn and give it to him. If you're a queen, act like a queen. Give it to him. Muhammad man. Ali told me that. I was with Muhammad, and he said, wait a minute, man. And he turned, and he just gave it to him. And they took their pictures, and he waved, and they waved. Thank you very Be much, Be a fellow. king, yeah. yeah. If you don't want to get noticed, don't go to a public gym every day, because somebody's going to see you there. Go to the gym in your house. I can go to restaurants, and if I put out the right vibe, nobody will go near me. That's right. If I put out that other vibe and say, hello, how are you, and sign an autograph, all of a sudden you're, you're in the mobbed. middle of yeah. You can do it. But that stuff of, gee, the paparazzi won't leave me alone, give me a break, will you? If the paparazzi did leave you alone for three days, you'd blow your brains out because you wouldn't have the attention so you anyway, wanted. So anyway, Marilyn, if, if, if there were a bunch of people taking photographs, well, she... You can see it. Smile, Look yeah. at the old newsreels of her. Sure. She always turned and gave it to them. You want Marilyn, watch this. And she'd turn it on, and it'd be great, and then she'd go about her business. Yeah, yeah. And no, no, she didn't have to run down the block with people. You know, in my whole life, since 1936, I never had a bad scene except once or twice with photographers. Once, once I whacked a guy for a very personal reason. Not because he was shooting pictures, but because he said something. Mm -hmm. And he said something about my daughter. And then I said, hey, you want a really great picture? Because he kept shooting me coming in and out of the motor home. Yeah. And you know, when you're on location out in the middle of the streets, you can't do nothing about that. Who cares? Let him shoot pictures. So I said, come here. And we walked around the corner of the motor home, and boy, I hooked him. Bang. And I don't hit hard, but if I get close to somebody and I can get a left at him, he put his camera up to protect himself. And, the, and the, I hit the camera, it went in his face. He and the camera both went down, and that was the name of that tune. But that didn't have to do with shooting pictures. That had to do with the remark you made getting, about your daughter. Yeah, exactly. Getting out of line. Gail, I'm glad you called. Thanks oh, for can watching. Can I say one quick thing? Okay. Uh, just that, Robert Blake, you talked so much about all the people that you know. And I just think that you're the one that people are going to say they know years to come. You are such a phenomenal. I mean, you're just such a mensch. You're just a, you're a real person. You say w how things are, and um, I've loved you for years. Gail, how do you like the way his face looks? I think you look phenomenal. So do I. So do I. Hey, love. I'll do this show for I'm nothing if you keep calling I'm a 35-year-old woman back. alone in my apartment, absolutely content. <laughs> All right, Gail. Uh, thanks again for calling, and have a hey, great Gail. weekend. I feel better, Tom. When I get that mom. website, you call in, and I'll give you something. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Okay, yeah. bye. Trouble. <laughs> we, we're with Robert Blake. We'll continue with... Uh, Wise-ass. <laughs> that's me, Mr. Wise-ass. We'll continue with Robert, you on the toll-free right after this short time out. With Robert Blake, you, you had a friend, an actor, who recently passed on, Robert Jekyll? Dick Jekyll. Or Richard yeah. Jekyll. Yeah. They're just, I love Jake. I, I, I was in Europe with him. And for those who don't know of his work, what were some of the things that he did with you? Oh, he was in all of, of, of Ulrich's pictures. He goes way back to Steel Helmet and all those. Yeah. There was a breed of men 
in Hollywood, directors, uh, Hellinger, uh, Hathaway, Ford, and they hired men. I don't mean butch. I mean that they were just, what they were is what they were. Mitchum. They Mitchum. shook her hand. That was their bond. They were straight ahead kind of people. The movies that were made were straight ahead. You know, Gable was made by the times he lived in. Yeah. It's too bad yeah. that Harrison Ford can't be Clark Gable. He should be, by the way. But they won't make those kind of movies. No. They have to make those movies where he's jumping over buildings yeah, and playing Air Superman. Yeah, Air Force One, blowing up the plane. But he could be Gable. I've seen him in little pictures before he became what he is. And there was a time in Hollywood when those directors put those kind of men in the right kind of films. I'm not talking about the fact that, that there was, you know, women were second-class citizens. But in a strange way, the women who weren't second-class citizens were far more advanced. Like, I would stack Betty Davis's life and career up against and any. contribution, and she would come out ahead of most people today, male or female. It was just a better time. Hi, darling. Yeah, we finally got you an audience member in here. I'll get by <laughs> as long as I have. Hey, this is great, man. I'll do this show for nothing. And she don't talk back. No, she don't. And she hasn't had her chest fixed either. That's real. <laughs> You talk about real men. I mentioned the name Robert Mitchum, huh? Yeah. And Jack, Pal Jack Palance, huh? And, uh, and, and Charles Bronson, huh? These were real guys, and Gable and, and Tracy. They, and they, Dick Boone and Jansen, even the guys on television. Dick and, Boone and in was, his own way, Jimmy Stewart, huh? I love Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, I, yeah straight ahead guy. They, they <laughs> Richard Boone was one of my mentors. In a roundabout way, he's the guy who got me in cold blood because he gave me the television performances that Brooks looked at and hired me to do In Cold Blood. Mm -hmm. I was on a series that he had called The Richard Boone Show, oh, sure. The Repertory Company. Sure, I remember it well. Wonderful, crazy man. I patterned my whole life after crazy man. Like when I was at The Rascals, Alfie was my hero, because mm -hmm. Alfie was totally nuts. Alfie would do anything in a heartbeat. I told you, he killed a goat, yeah, you told I told us. You, he took time. gum and stuck it in the camera at lunchtime because the cameraman got made him mad. And I saw him and spanked you in gum and sticking it. Dick Boone. I went to work once on Monday morning on the Richard Boone Repertory Company. There was nobody there. No crew, no cast, not one person. All there was was the guy making the donuts and me. Dick had gotten angry on Friday with the network. He hired a 747 and took everybody connected with the show to Hawaii. I'm the only person they couldn't get in touch with because I was fishing. Yeah. I came to work Monday morning. There was nobody there. Everybody stayed in Hawaii drunk. It must have cost them a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Now, that's a mensch. That's stuff you remember for the rest of your and life. And that stuff doesn't happen much anymore. No. no it's, uh, this man. is not that kind of a town anymore. No. You know why people think I'm interesting? Because the town is really boring. boring. Thank you. There was a time when Bogey and people like that were doing stuff that would make me look like Donald Duck. Now ain't nobody doing nothing. So if you happen to dance in the middle of the freeway or something, boy, that guy is really crazy. <laughs> well, you think about taking a, an airplane yeah. and everybody connected oh, yeah. with the series going to Hawaii and say, hey, there ain't no more series until you Listen, and they've told me stories the nights that Bogart and, uh, and uh, Tracy were together drinking. They go to the old Chasen's restaurant and they steal, they steal old man Chasen's safe and roll it down the street at 2 o'clock in the morning with people honking horns at him. You and see? people knew it was Bogey and they knew it was Tracy and they knew they were crazy, but Hollywood was a crazy place then. Yes. Now it's just a larger than life. Now it's just a company town. I have to pause again for the sponsors and the stations back for a few more minutes with Robert Blake after this timeout. Now here is Randy in Randolph, Massachusetts. Hi, Randy. You're on the air. Hello there, Tom. Hello. It strikes me as unusual that a man named Randolph would live in Randolph, Mass, but these things yes. happen. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Robert Blake. Yes, sir. Uh, 
many times over the years I saw Mr. Blake on talk shows, and I remember two in particular with the legendary Lucille Ball, and they were having a grand time, and they were laughing it up, and, and Lucy was in great form, and Robert was in great form, and he turned over to Lucille Ball, and he said, you know, you're a class act, Lucy. I just love your work. So my question is to Robert, what is his greatest and fondest memory of Miss Ball? I was doing a talk show with Miss Ball, and... <laughs> I had done my thing, and Lucy came out and did her thing, and then a man came out who was supposed to be a sculptor who worked in plaster. And he had the trowel and the thing and yeah, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And he was going to teach Lucy how to do some troweling. And he was a little arrogant and a little filled with himself. And Lucy got up, and they put the smock on her and all this stuff, and they gave her a big pile of plaster and the trowel and I'm sitting over there on the couch and Lucy's looking at me and I'm looking at her and I'm saying she don't have the guts she does not have the guts to do it and she did it the guy turned around and she smacked that thing in his ass <laughs> <laughs> it spread all over everything she was one of my heroes yeah. one of those larger than life People. Yep. There, by the way, we mentioned Legendary. guys. There were women in this town. Barbara Stanwyck and May Lucille it please Ball. The court. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned one, Betty Davis, who was a great broad out here, and and a tough one, Joan Crawford. Okay. Yeah. I remember interviewing she and her husband um, when Pepsi bought the vodka company out here in Hollywood in the '60s, and she was at the old Brown Derby in Hollywood throwing them back. I mean, she threw them back, man. I'll tell you, Joni, Joni was a drinker. Yes. Weren't we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, weren't we all? Anyway, Randolph, I'm glad you called. What was the show that you saw Bob on with Lucille Ball? Do you recall? Yes, um, Tom. I remember distinctly it was when John Davidson did a talk show for a while. Oh, right. Lucy came on and um, Robert Blake, and I believe even Lucy Arnaz was on. She Could be. wrote a song about her mother called My Mother the Star, and she sang it to her mother, and her mo yeah. mother got all teary-eyed, and it was a beautiful moment. Yeah, yeah. And By the way, you Gary know... Gary Martin, her second husband, and of course, they had Gail Gordon, and Gail was doing some of those great things that he used to do when they worked together, like, Lucille, you're fired, and things like another that. Two minutes, just, <laughs> another, another, another two minutes, you're going to get a paycheck. Another another two minutes, he's going to get the show. <laughs> I mean, they're really wonderful people. I mean, Robert, I agree with Gail. Gail said they're going to remember Bro Robert Blake, the, the way they remember Lucy and Catherine Hepburn and Adam Sinatra and all those great people. Ah, Sinatra. Randy, you're, you're a good man to call us. Thank you because for watching. And... up there with the best of them. And, Tom, you're the greatest talk show host okay. there ever was or ever will be. I want I some of what he's drinking. <laughs> and I remember you during the 70s when you did your talk show. Absolutely. Late Listen, uh, Randy, Mrs. Randy. Hey, 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 Randy. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Ra good night, Randy, I'm out of time, but thanks for calling, pal. And tell Marie Snyder that uh, she she's great and have one of those camels or lucky strikes for me. Me, whichever that is, she spoke. Oh, okay, great, Randy. Thanks for calling, buddy. I'm going to go get a little affection. <laughs> yeah, you, on the yeah air. <laughs> you, you take care of Zelda in the back row, and thanks for coming on tonight, my friend. We'll see you here in my a couple pleasure. of Fridays from now. We'll get the blue haired ladies yet. Okay. Back to tell you about Monday night after this short break. Thanks, Randy. You know, every now and again, I wish we would tape this sucker at 5 o'clock in the afternoon until a guy like Randy calls from Randolph, Massachusetts, and kind of makes it happen here on live TV, and that's neat, and that's why we don't tape it at 5 in the afternoon. I wasn't my best tonight because I got a cold coming on and I feel like crap, so thank you for putting up with me. And I hope you come back on Monday night for Cokie Roberts from ABC News and the great writer Ann Rice. Don't forget, a black hole is where God divided by zero. Back Monday night, same time, same station. If you like the full Monty, you'll love this. Good night, everybody.